Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on the time zone you're in. Um, this is Frank with a V Brownback, and today I have got Sam McGowan, um, who will give us a rather short 60 minute introduction um, into the uh, NSX API. Hot topic, especially for cloudy customers. Um, but also, if you're into automation, um, API is, is a keyword everywhere. I, I, I think I've, um, I've seen that pop up on every booth now, um, on every trade show that I've been to. Um, it's, if, if, if it doesn't list API, it's not hot anymore. Just a bit of housekeeping before we kick off. Um, as always, you can reach us via the normal Twitter handles. Um, I'll be monitoring Twitter on the vbrownback hashtag throughout the show as well. Um, if you actually do want to present on one, um, also feel free to get in touch. Um, if the EMEA time zone doesn't suit you, uh, we do have other shows running on a weekly basis as well. Um, so feel feel free to get in touch if you want to present. Um, you can ask Sam after the show if it if it actually hurts or if, if I'm okay as a host. And with that, I'd say over to you, Sam. I'll give you a presenter. Thanks, Frank. Uh, so hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam McGowan. I'm just going to get my presentation up and running. Can Frank, can you see? Uh, that looks good. My screen. Yep, got it. Okay, so this is an introduction to the NSX APIs. Um, my name's Sam McGowan, and I'm working now for VMware um, as part of the PSO practice for NSX. Um, so I'm a senior consultant and I, uh, I'm, I'm working with various customers uh, on NSX and also automation. Uh, and over the last sort of three or four years, I've been working on sort of lots of large scale automation projects, um, mainly based on VRA, but um, generally and typically working with NSX and, uh, and sort of using the APIs and that sort of thing. So I've got a fair bit of experience working with the APIs. Um, so that's who I am and why I'm talking to you. Um, so a little bit of an agenda. Um, Going to have a look at sort of getting started, what I use in my toolkit to uh, to work with the APIs, um, some basics around the NSX API, and a little bit of how I work with it and a few sort of tips and tricks. Um, I'm going to look at the NSX API structure, so where everything is within the API, um, how you get to things, what, how you find things. Um, and then uh, I'm going to do a little, little bit of a demo of you actually using the APIs. So hopefully that will be interesting for everyone and I won't run out of time and I won't go too quickly. Um, so without any further ado, um, uh, what's in my toolkit? So uh, I think most people probably working with APIs are probably looking at a similar sort of toolkit. Um, the main thing that I use is Postman. Um, which is a free download. It, it's a Chrome extension, effectively. Um, and the URLs on the screen. Um, I like using Postman. It's got a little bit of automation itself. So um, things like you can you can take results, test results of queries, and push them into variables and things like that. You can sort of automate your automation a little bit and automate your testing. Um, one thing that uh, I'll put up there is, is to disable SSL verification. Every single, every single time I install Postman, I forget that I need to disable SSL. And if you're working in a lab or working with self-signed certificates, it'll just fail. And eventually you'll figure out that it's because you've not disabled SSL ver verification. So uh, a little tip from my toolkit there. Um, Visual Studio Code uh, I use for uh, writing PowerShell, writing Python, things like that. Um, and also for wrangling JSON and XML files around. Um, I find it a very good editor. Um, and if you're certainly if you're programming other languages, then it's uh, it's very useful. Um, PowerShell and uh, specifically for NSX, I use PowerNSX. Um, it's it's pretty awesome. It's it's a great project. Um, huge amount of work's gone into it, and it's it's excellent for uh, looking at examples of the API calls that you're going to do. So if you know any PowerShell and you want to dissect a few API calls, have a look at the uh, the PSM one file of of the uh, PowerNSX module, and you can um, 
you can you can sort of reverse engineer some some calls without too much uh, trouble. Uh, and finally, when I'm obviously working with VRA and, and uh, VMware products um, for automation, I use vRealize Orchestrator. Um, I'm not going to do anything on vRealize Orchestrator today because um, it's a different sort of different kettle of fish working with it. But certainly, the API is very important when you're working with, say, dynamic types to import things into VRA as, as items, um, and anything that's outside of VRA's default. Um, integrations with NSX which are good but they're not perfect um, there are limitations and um, that's where VRI's orchestrator comes in quite a lot um, so that's typically my my tool set um, the, the basics of the the API um, so I've called them the, the API Bible these two links here there's a PDF uh, and a an HTML version of this um, uh, these these two documents really that they're, they're basically the same content different formats um, these are your reference guide for the API um, quite often I'll bang my head against the wall for a while and I'll flick into the API guide and I'll see exactly what um, what I was looking for I just missed it before so um, it, these really are very good documents and uh, very detailed and they give you a lot of information about what you need to do so that yeah they are your Bible so the NSX API, um, it uses basic authentication. So that means that you're sending a header with every request that you're doing. Um, the uh, the API runs over HTTPS, so it's TCP over 443, um, and it's using the same certificate as the web interface for NSX. Um, so it's pretty standard, pretty easy to access across firewalls and that sort of thing. Um, Pretty much every, in fact, every uh, request that you're going to do is going to have a content type application XML header, and mm, the majority of the responses will be application XML. Um, there is a sort of unsupported JSON um, API. Um, I much prefer working with JSON than XML, but um, the, the, for a sort of production environment, the only supported uh, method is using the XML. Um, that's a little gotcha I've, I've fallen foul of before. I spent ages designing at a customer for uh, JSON and then realized I had to transcribe everything into XML. Not my uh, not my finest hour, I don't think. Um, you can also use um, different query parameters. Um, most, uh, most frequent ones um, having a start index and page size uh, within the query to, to paginate results. So if you're listing a whole bunch of uh, virtual wires, you might see um, return them 20 at a time to look through them or something like that um, and then you'll also see within um, URLs a, a scope ID um, which is identifying a particular object or scope that you're you're working the request on um, so those those are sort of the, the basics um, now the other things that you need to look at when you're working with the API is you're going to need some object IDs um, from vCenter um, and there isn't really a glamorous way to get these. This is um, browsing to the managed object browser on with uh, logging in with your uh, your credentials and clicking through and finding the, the object IDs that you want. Um, it's possible to get them from PowerShell um, and you can use you can use the vCenter API for that. Um, but the, the simplest way is to, uh, is to click through and uh, I've just listed out here the common ones that you'd use would be a data center ID, um, a cluster or a host ID, resource group IDs, um, distributed switch IDs, port groups and VMs. Um, there is really actually a, a third way to cheat. <laughs> if, if you click an object in the vSphere web client, um, the URL will also usually contain the more FID of, of that object. Uh, that's good to know. Yeah. Uh, it's it, slightly it, easier than clicking through the, the object browser. Yeah, well, it, it, it depends when, when, when you kind of know um, where, where to go. The, the mob is very, very fast, right? Um, but yeah. if, if you just need that one virtual switch um, and you already have the client open, just, just mark it, copy and paste the, the URL to, to a text editor, and um, you'll pretty uh, quickly see the more FID off that as well. It's, it's something I use because I, I, I just can't remember the mob all the time. It's 
<laughs> you'd think I know by now after working with this for five more than five years, <laughs> but no, I, I can't. Uh, no. Also, also, quick question on the previous slide: the the single yes. point of entry for this would still be the NSX manager, right? If, even if you have NSX controller or edge calls, you you only need to open 443 on the NSX manager, right? Yeah, that, that's correct. So the NSX manager provides your API access for, for every component. Um, and that's that's your only single point of management there. There's no APIs presented by anything else. No, no available APIs anyway. Uh, okay, so thanks for that, Frank. Um, so uh, so I'm typically um, how, how I work, my typical process, um, is if I'm looking to deploy something um, via the API, I'll deploy it manually first through the, the user interface, um, configuring the settings that I specifically want to use. Um, and then I'll, I'll use a, a get method. So use an API method to view the configuration and, and that will pull back an XML file that contains the configuration settings and, and uh, everything that I need to be able to then work out the, what I need to post or put to the method. Um, I then have a look at the API docs, so those those two links that I had earlier, um, to make sure that the format I'm writing it in is correct. Sometimes the format that was returned is slightly different um, from the format that you need to push. For um, for example, with edges, um, if you look at the look at an edge configuration it'll pull back a lot more information than you actually need to push to it and it'll be in a slightly different format. Um, so that's why I'd, I'd always refer back to the API docs just to make sure I'm, I'm pushing the right amount of information. Um, I'd then uh, test run the method in Postman. So I'm manually posting to uh, to the API um, just to check that something's actually working, how I expect it to work. Uh, and then once I'm confident that I've got the format correct, the values correct and all that sort of thing, then I'll start to write the uh, the actual code to generate that. So whether that's in PowerShell or VRO, um, I'll, I'll that's that's my, my typical sort of process for, for getting to the point where I'm writing code. Um, quite often, as I mentioned before, PowerNSX has, has probably already written some code to do what you want. Um, so it's I find it immensely helpful as a reference um, for for API calls that um, and and just the, the order and the method of doing things um, is very good. So you can dig through that uh, PSM1 file, uh, have a look at the code, and uh, and that's that's all up on GitHub and stuff. So it's a great resource for actually learning. The APIs as well. Um, one thing that really helped me is actually learning my HTTP error codes. Um, although, like Postman is quite helpful, it'll tell you what the codes mean. Um, you can also, um, you know, just if you're familiar with the codes, it'll it'll knock that few seconds off. The oh, why did that come back? Oh, okay, it's that. It's you know whatever code it's come back as, it's not authorized or it's an invalid format or something like that. Um, also let Postman write your code, and I'll show this in a minute when I um when I jump into Postman for the um demo. Um, but um you can there are quite a few um you can grab a drop down, and there's quite a few languages you can select, and you can actually grab the code for the request that you're making in that language. So whether it's JavaScript or um, whether it's Python or C sharp or something like that, you can actually um you can actually grab a snippet of code that will run that request, um, which is very useful if you're uh, if you're new at a language or something like that. Um, so, moving on from that, um, we're going to have a look at the uh, NSX API structure, um, and the best way I've found to present this is actually um, a mind map. Um, I, it, the mind map is not Mr. Messy, um, but you might see from the mind map that it is a little bit random uh, at first glance as to where some things are in the API. So I'm actually going to duck out of this um, presentation for a minute, hopefully. And if I can work PowerPoint. <laughs> Hit escape. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so we're out of there. Let's pull up a mind map. Okay. So switch into presentation mode for this. Okay. So 
this is um, assuming the 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 NSX APIs start at um, forward slash API. Um, so it's your NSX manager forward slash API. Um, you then have um, basically four numbers broken up. Uh, so you get a, a 1.0, uh, 2.0, 3.0, and 4.0. Um, in between some versions before, I've seen like a 2.1, but um, it, it's, I don't, I have absolutely no idea why it's structured that way. I assume it's different versions of the API being released um, and different functionality being released at different times. Um, but it gives you this sort of confusing map of different, uh, different things at different places. So what I've done is I've actually um, color coded some of these tasks. So um, for example, I put, tasks that I would class as, as infrastructure classes, uh, infrastructure tasks, uh, they're blue, and monitoring ones are green, and, and the sort of firewall and security tasks I put as orange. Um, and the reason for this is, is purely for my own, my own uh, sort of sanity of being able to differentiate between things. Um, some, of the, some of the ones, the API ones that you use quite frequently, or you might use um, just as a set up, um, for example, the, uh, the appliance management. So that would be um, forward slash API, forward slash 1.0, forward slash appliance management. Uh, and then there would be methods under there um, that you would be using, um, for example, to configure the network, to you can set up backups, upgrades, um, do the manager certificates. So everything under the appliance management relates to, or seems to relate to things that are under the NSX management uh, NSX manager interface so when you log on directly to the web interface on the manager before you've even configured anything on vCenter that um, that management interface is there um, then I mean going through things like um, network fabric are under the 2.0 um, SSO config and, and vCenter config um, those are sort of the infrastructure services so when you're actually getting started and you want to plumb in a lookup service URL or the uh, the vCenter you can actually um, you can use the APIs for that and I'm going to do that in my demo in a minute um, you've also got control of the across vCenter NSX so the universal sync objects um, VDN um, relates to the uh, sort of VXLAN and um, transport zones and logical switches um, things like conf configuring the segment ID pools um, and the port that you're using VXLAN on, um, that can be changed by the API. It used to only be the API, and now it's in the interface as well. Um, deploying controllers and controller cluster, um, all of those come under this 2.0 slash VDN. Um, some of these are less less often used, like the, the IP, IP discovery and Mac learning. Um, one of the ones you'll see used most often is this uh, 4.0 API, which is allows you to configure edges and the distributed firewall. Um, so that's your edges, your logical routers, and the distributed firewall. They're um, they're the ones that you sort of see used most often, um, probably along with the um, logical switch ones. So creating creating and configuring logical switches. Um, so uh, I mean if, if if I zoom out a little bit, you can see that it's actually quite a sprawling API, um, and this is why the uh, the document is so critical for your uh, success of using the APIs because um, you won't remember all of it and you won't remember where everything goes. Um, so it's it's very useful to have that sort of lookup functionality there. Is is there any any functions that you would say stand out that that are API only? At, at the current release that you would be aware of? Like you, you mentioned uh, um, the excellent port change um, was eventually um, configurable via GUI. Um, is, is there anything on the top of your head where you would say, this is an API only task, I don't have a GUI option to co actually configure this? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I don't think so, no. Um, I think there's more or less parity between it. The only time um, that you might see someone needing to use the API um, over the interface um, specifically for a task is if they um, uh, if they, they lock themselves out of vCenter using the distributed firewall. And so you have to recover by um, by deleting the um, distributed firewall rule sets. Um, 
because the the uh, NSX uh, manager will automatically be dis excluded from the uh, distributed firewall. That's the only time I think at the moment that I would see the API only kind of config, and that's a very niche circumstance which you shouldn't say, let yourself get into really. Um, <laughs> Makes for a fun support call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm sure they're, they're, they're the most fun kind of support calls. Uh, Okay, um, so uh, I just mentioned if anyone wants this mind map, I've put a PDF up of, uh, on uh, GitHub with um, the the uh, Postman collection of what I'm actually going to demonstrate in a minute. So um, that's uh, uh, that's all available, and I've got a link at the end. So if anyone wants to grab a PDF of that, then that's more you're more than welcome to do so. Um, uh, I'm sure we can link in the notes or whatever. Um, oh, yeah, so, yeah. If, if, if you have it on GitHub, I'll include it in the YouTube recording link as well. Perfect, perfect, sounds good. Um, let's jump into a demo. So um, here we've got some, some API calls that I've handily prepared earlier. Um, but before we look at that, let's just have a quick look at the environment. Um, so, uh, this is, uh, I'm working in a nested environment because that's what my lab um, is set up to do. Um, so, just, this is the outer vCenter, the, the vCenter that's managing the physical environment. The uh, inner vCenter is what, what I'm actually going to be configuring. So, you can see here I've got three hosts configured. Um, they're, they're all, they're, there's virtually nothing done to it except for I've, I've created a VDS and the hosts are all using the VDS um, and the hosts have vSEN configured so I've got some storage available um, but uh, the environment itself is, is nested and it's this pod 205 so you can see I've got the three SSI hosts. I've deployed an NSX manager um, so that's the OVF deployment um, and then I've got a platform service controller and, and a, a VCSA um, so that, that's that's the whole environment that I'll be working in um, and it, how that manifests here is, is just as a sort of v, empty vCenter in this case. Um, you can see that uh, NSX hasn't been installed yet, it's not been uh, connected to vCenter and uh, this is the vCenter, uh, the NSX manager for that environment and um, you can see that it's it's been deployed uh, but there's nothing configured on it, um, so we've not even we've not got an NTP server set up, not a syslog set up. It's all pretty much uh, bare. Um, so um, let's flip over to Postman. Um, so the two the two files that I've put up on GitHub, uh, this um, NSX uh, NSX API um, folder here, which is all these. Uh, these methods and then also I have this uh, environment so um, if you're not familiar with Postman you can configure environments um, and you can see that within this nested environment I've configured um, some usernames and passwords um, some, some generic stuff that I can put into the uh, into the queries um, so quick question for you before you start do yes. you mind showing where to go to uh, configure the SSL thing that you mentioned before so that we have that on video as well? Yeah, sure. For, for people yeah. new to this, um, it, it is super frustrating. I think at the first time around, it cost me like two hours to find this setting. And I was wondering, yeah. God, what am I doing wrong? Yeah, it's it's when it's the first time it's fine. When it's like the fifth time you've installed Postman and you're still doing it, then it's then it's really irritating. Um, yeah. So by default, when when you install this setting, SSL certificate verification is is on, and you just need to flick it off. Um, and that's that's um, I mean I'm on a Mac here, but um, that's preferences. I assume it's very similar in, in the PC as well. Yeah, it is. Um, but that's that's literally all I do. Let's flick off the SSL verification. Um, so, um, just to just to wet our um, wet our whistle a little bit, um, the first call I'm going to do is just to configure the NTP um, before we do anything more complex. Um, and you can see here that um, first of all I'm setting an authorization header 
So I'm, I've selected basic authentication. Um, remember I said from the, the, the API basics, that it's, it's basic authentica authentication. Um, and then I've got these variables here, NSX admin and NSX admin pass. And, and these two curly brackets are basically how you access uh, NSX admin and NSX admin pass are the two variables that I'm accessing there. Um, so uh, you can actually have multiple different environments. And so when, when I select that one that's connecting to my lab with, with a certain set of variables, that was my vCenter, that one's one of my web hosts, things like that. So um, there's it's quite a useful functionality to be able to, um, to just configure some environment variables and be able to move between environments very quickly. Um, the next thing we're going to check is the headers. So um, I'm requesting content type application XML, and as I mentioned before, most of the um, most of the APIs will automatically return um, XML, um, but um, you can also actually specify accept and then the value of application XML. Um, and that's 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 two headers just set there. But the one you absolutely must have is um, content type. Uh, and then finally, there's the body. Um, so this is what you're actually. Um, I'm making a put request here. So I'm putting this content to the API. Um, and generally, a put is when you are um, updating some configuration that's already there. So there's already um, some settings or you're updating some settings um, so in this one I've got a, an NTP server in my lab um, and I'm going to push up the time zone as UTC um, and it's just a standard XML text document uh, and it, it is as simple as uh, NSX manager is an environment variable as well um, from that that uh, API call so it'll be sending it to the IP of my manager API uh, 1.0 appliance management system time settings. Um, so when I actually send that, it will send the request and then we'll get a response from the uh, the API. There we go. It's a little bit slow, but um, the API response is, remember I said about the status codes, HTTP 200 OK. Um, you, can, you can see the response. Um, you can see headers and everything like that so you're able to break it down and have a look at things that's sometimes useful sometimes not um, but this body is the is the raw is the raw response xml formatted from the uh, from the api and that's just confirming that date time setting that i've just done and if we switch over to uh, the nsx manager we can confirm yeah actually i set that api to my ntp server um, not the most exciting of API calls, um, but it's a good little getting started uh, call. Uh, so, just just quickly on the return to codes, um, the the two hundred is normal, right? Um, yeah. Don't be surprised if you see a two o three as well. That that usually also tells you the request was successful. I uh, just didn't have yeah. a response. And a two o one as well. Yeah. So any, anything in the 200 range is typically an okay response, a good response. It's done what you want. Um, 400 would be um, an object not found. Uh, 500 would be a server-side error. Um, so there's sort of generic groupings that you can see. Yeah, 400 um, usually means you fat-fingered the, the body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you made me have done it. But the interesting one with um, the NSX API is when it returns a 419, I think it is, um, That that's usually... Um, you've put in an ID of an object where you shouldn't put in an ID, um, but it, it is, it's it's a tricky one to hunt down, that one. Um, so I'm gonna start whistling through my um, my API calls now to, uh, actually one other thing uh, before I do that. What can I, what can I do? Also, uh, since we just talked about the status codes, do, do you just wanna quickly talk about the the four major keywords you're you're using in a REST API for, for people not familiar with it, post, put, get, and uh, what's the one for delete? Delete. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, the four, four ma major methods, um, as Frank just listed. Um, so here I'm doing a put, um, and as, as I described before, that's, that's sort of when you're patching 
uh, information over the top of other information. A post is typically when you're creating a new object. Um, and you'll see on the left hand side here, I've got quite a lot of posts because I'm, quite, I'm going through and creating some objects. Um, typically, uh, the ones you'll start with is using get. So get is uh, completely non-destructive, you're reading information. Um, and so um, much like when you're learning PowerShell and you use a whole bunch of get commands, um, using the get API is brilliant because you can look, you can get familiar with stuff and, and you can pull back information and have a look at it um, without ever having to worry about actually doing any damage to anything. Um, and then finally, the uh, the delete method, which is um, uh, I'm not actually well, I can I can probably demonstrate that at the end if I hurry up. Um, but that's that's when you're typically going to be doing the opposite of a post when you're going to be deleting an object. Um, and typically, you'll be referencing uh, an ID, an object ID, when you're doing that. Um, so one thing I mentioned before was the uh, the code snippets that you can generate. Um, and so you can see here, um, this is the the the, HT, the raw HTTP that is sent over the wire. Um, but you can drop down and and you can say, oh, how if I wanted to do it in curl, how would I do that? And so you can actually grab that code snippet and you could paste it into a Linux server with curl and that would do exactly the same thing as that api call but just using curl um, similarly you might do it with jquery or you might be doing it with php or python so any, any of these uh any of these languages you can you can actually grab it and say look there there is my go code to make this api call which is which is incredibly useful especially if you're just sort of learning a language and you want to work out how to make api calls um, also for, the, very useful function. also for the orchestrator bit, right? This this basically gives you the JavaScript you need for your actions. Yeah, yeah kind of, because uh, um, orchestrator doesn't use jQuery. Yeah. So, um, but you can kind of get the idea, um, especially around the data structure and things as well. Yeah. Um, yeah so that that's that's useful. Um, so. Uh, Let's just, for fun, configure the syslog server. We'll send that one off. So again, it's my lab syslog server login site. Um, port, protocol, off it goes. Um, and when I was talking about the API documents, um, this is how I look up working with syslog servers. So this is how I picked out the uh, the code for that particular request that's where the uri is it, it's it's put oh, sorry that one's the put um that one's if you want to look up the syslog server um but yeah it, it's, it's got the format and everything that you need um right there so um although i'm going to whistle through some of these um it's good to know where where to actually get that format from where because it when it gets to more complicated requests you actually have um a little bit more of decisions to make, a little bit more XML to build. Um, so uh, again, uh, simple uh, SSO config. So we're doing that um, uh, lookup under under the NSX Manager Management Service. Go on, you know you want to. Here we go. So lookup service and vCenter are blank. Um, I'm just going to. So I've got some variables again in here but basically it's the, the platform service controller is the lookup service um, SSO admin is the vCenter admin and vCenter admin password and you'll notice here that I've got a, a, a blank certificate thumbprint so I could go to the platform service controller I could open up the uh, certificate and I could pull out the thumbprint from the uh, from the certificate uh, and paste that in here um, or I could do as I lazily do in the uh, in, in the user interface and, and send it without that request in it and it pops back with an error telling you this is the uh, SSO, this is the thumbprint um, and I can then paste that in. API has gone slow. Normally it's much much more uh, rapid than that. So this is the this is the thumbprint that's been returned from my uh, from my platform service controller. So I'm just going to populate that, send it again. And hopefully we should have a configured SSO. There we go. So the status is true and the message is done. So uh, we're configured. 
uh, and we'll, we'll have a quick look at that in the API. So again, uh, exactly, almost exactly the same. It reflects the interface. Um, you got the vCenter IP address, username, password. The thumbprint, if it's not there, um, then you make the request. Uh, it will respond with the thumb with an error and say the thumbprint's missing. Um, you've got a couple of options to configure the. Um, so when you when you configure it in the inter user interface, you can tick a box to change it to put a proxy in or, or change the download of the uh, vibs and uh, or the not the vibs the um, uh, vSphere uh, plugin for the um, uh, web client, sorry. Um, and then this assign role to user um, defines whether you assign the admin role, so the, the um, enterprise admin role to the user that you're using to configure the connection. Um, so I'm just going to pop that certificate back in there because otherwise I'll make two requests. Whack out a send and then we can flip over to the management service, hit refresh, and there we go. So we're connected, and it's just about to do an inventory update, its first inventory update. Um, so uh, I'm going to jump back on to here. Um, now, in the background right now, I'm going to put an NSX license in. Um, the reason I'm doing that in the background is because uh, I don't want to show everyone the NSX license that I'm using. Uh, and if I don't assign that license, um, when I come to do things uh, that aren't licensed, so by default you get the NSX for vSphere, um, so, sorry, the vShield uh, replacement. Um, and uh, I want to do a bit more than vShield, I want to deploy some other components. So uh, I need to make sure that I've got that license in place. Okay, so that's installed in the background. Um, now we're still not going to see anything in here until we log out, log back in. And then we should see that inventory has been done. And Oh, this can take a while, right? Up to five minutes to just load the plugin. <laughs> no, not in my superb, super fast lab. It'll happen in seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so you did get the all flesh approved by your manager, apparently, for your own lab. <laughs> my, my, my manager being my wife, maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah, home management, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, so um, I'll just quickly go over the next step that we're going to go to while that's loading. We're going to create a, a controller IP pool. So in order to deploy controllers, we need to create an IP pool to assign IP addresses to the controllers. Um, so I'm just sticking in a, a range of IPs um, and a gateway and the name for it and, and a prefix, which is um, given the subnet mask. Um, and then let's have a look. Yeah, we've now got the networking security plugin and we can go to the installation tab and we'll we'll see that we've got a manager we don't have any controller nodes yet there we go so we're all we're all blank it's a blank canvas so now i can hit send oh the other thing you got here is a scope id um and as i mentioned in uh, earlier you need sometimes you need to scope things um if you're scoping something generally um there's a global route zero scope ID and that allows you to do things uh, that affect the entire system for example like a, an IP uh, address pool um, so I've, re I've got an ID returned here from this call so I've got 201 created HTTP 201 request has been fulfilled and resulted in a new resource being created um, so there you go you're starting to learn your codes already um, and I've got this IP address pool dash one identifier which I'm going to copy and we're going to use to deploy a controller. So the controller spec um, is defined here and we've got uh, a name which is you, you can define it yourself, uh, a description which you don't really need, um, the IP, IP pool ID which is the one that we've just generated and then we've got this resource pool ID, data store ID, network ID um, and remember when I was talking about the managed object browser before um, this is the managed object browser. So I've logged on and you can find things under, for example, uh, content. Okay. Uh, and under content, we will then, this is, this is what, this is why uh, it takes me a while to do this. Uh, 
root folder. That's it. So that takes me to a data center. Under my data center, uh, I've got a child entity. I have a data center. Under that, I've got a host folder. Uh, host folder. Under that host folder, I've got a cluster, which is a child entity again. And under that cluster, so domain seven is is the cluster reference ID domain c7 which i'll be using later um, and then also there's a resource pool which is the generic resources of that cluster which is res group 8 which is the one i'm going to be using to deploy to for this particular api call um, so a little bit of a whiz through the manage object browser there but um, you can see it's it, that's why i've included the path for clicking in that in those slides um, because unless you know what you're doing you can get lost pretty quickly and spend a while clicking around so resource group 8 is pointing to that cluster um, the data store 17 i know is the uh, the id of the vsan data store and then the dv port group 16 is the id of the uh, of the port group within so the vlan backed port group within within my data center so let, let's test out frank's uh, my theory Frank's method of finding it yeah yeah so the easiest way is really just uh, for for you command a there, oh, there it is right port group 16 yeah dv port group 16 so that's that's the reference of it um, you probably want to url decode it and then that might be uh, uh, yeah. yeah an easy way to find it right there well, I, I mean, after a while, right, you, you know how the MoRefs start, and then yeah, it's, you, it's, it's, it's very see. easy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, deploy type. Um, so this is a little bit of a legacy um, thing because uh, NSX 6.3 will only deploy a four CPU, four gig of RAM uh, VM. There's no different sizes now. Um, so it doesn't matter what value you pass there, but um, I, I tried it without earlier and it didn't like it. So. Uh, I'm sticking that in there, and then NSX controller pass is again another variable from my uh, my environment uh, where I've just generated a random string for the controller password. Um, so this query is going to take it's going to take a few seconds, but it's going to return us a job ID. I think there you go. So we've got a job data ID, job data 108. If we flip over into vCenter we should see that we're deploying an OVF template so that's the that's the um, controller being deployed um, but we can also have a look at this using the, uh, the this API the task service API um, and what we can do is send a get request where did I do deploy controller job data 108 so we're referencing the ID that's not working. So we're referencing the ID of that task. And we're just sending a basic authorization and a get request this time, just to get the config. And it's returning to me um, information on the task that's uh, that's being executed now. So it's saying it's, it's on the deploy OVSF task, it started and it's executing. Um, the next task it's got will be, um, initializing it still says v shield um so then it'll do post boot config tasks power on tasks uh, initial up post deployment config tasks there's a series of tasks um and then also like a, a failure action rollback if it fails um and so you can see that that task is, is still underway um and it'll take a few seconds now for the controller to deploy because it's on a nested vcern environment um it took about four minutes I think in my last testing um, so what we will do is we'll have a look through the rest of the the API calls that we're going to do um, so once the, the controller is deployed um, we're going to prepare the hosts um, so this is um, the the call to um, basically install the vibs of the uh, for NSX, um, so this is all infrastructure configuration. Um, so on my mind map, I, uh, there's those blue tasks. These are all configuring the infrastructure. They're all part of those blue tasks. Um, and the resource ID um, is the is the ID of the cluster um, of those three hosts. So when I looked up the cluster object before, it was that domain C7. Uh, the step after that, we're going to create an IP pool for the VTAPs configure vxlan um, so this is a slightly more in-depth step um, so we're going to 
configure a cluster mapping spec, spec I'll lose my teeth, um, where we're going to configure the, the distributed virtual switch. We're going to set the VLAN ID for the uh, transport, the underlay transport. Um, so this setting here is an interesting one. I don't know whether, what would happen if we specified more than one, but it should actually match the number of uplink port groups uh, in your virtual switch. Um, so uh, depending on your failover method, um, should it should change. Uh, so you'll have one for things like uh, if you were doing LACP or if you're doing, like I am, a failover of the, the physical NICs. Um, but I don't know what will happen if you send the, set the wrong uh, number of current VM kernels. Um, the address pool ID will be the address pool that we create in this step previously. Um, and again, then there's a, a VDS con context config spec, which means we're going to configure that distributed switch. Uh, we're going to configure the MTU for that port group and the teaming method, so failover order. Um, and so you, you can you can change those teaming methods based on the design. Um, I'm not going to go into the various methods now, um, but all of all of these caps. So these this is a, a preset list of options for teaming. They're all in your API guide. So um, as I keep calling it, the Bible of the of the uh, of the API. Um, let's see where we're at with that. Ah, oh, controller's going slowly. Um, after that, we're going to look, create a, a segment uh, segment pool. So we're going to use segment ID just to give that VNI for um, sort of VXLAN identifier for uh, each unique VXLAN. Uh, configure a transport zone, and we're going to create a logical switch that is a transit for the transit network. Uh, deploy an edge, which will be our provider logical router, so the north south point uh, in and out of your NSX environment, and then uh, deploy a, a distributed logical router that's connected with an interface up to the edge. Um, so that's the plan, however. Well, do we the need the, um, do we need the controller deployed before we can prepare the hosts? Those should be two independent tasks, right? Because the controller only right. comes into play once we create an actual transport zone. Um, if I remember let's correctly, <laughs> well, let's fire away and see if it errors out. Operation, uh, hold on, it's, it's not liking my license. What's wrong? Uh, I'm just going to dig into the licensing on another, another screen because I don't want to show the license. In case if the 60-day trial license is not enough for you, um, there, there's two very popular methods of actually getting a longer-term license. One is to become a V expert. Um, I've heard rumors if you present regularly on the V Brown back, that tremendously helps in that application because it gives <laughs> back to the community. Um, so with this being a shameless plug on our end, um, feel, feel free to. Um, to, to approach us, um, you don't have to do an hour, right? Um, if, if you have an interesting topic, um, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, no problem at all, we can easily facilitate that. Um, it helps in the v, uh, v expert application, most definitely. Um, all our regular presenters are actually V experts, and that gets you a one year license. Um, the other very popular method is to buy the VMAC Advantage, which now also includes a NSX license. Okay, so excellent plugging there, right on message. Yeah, and <laughs> the third way is to go to jobs.vmware.com. <laughs> <laughs> because they're, they're, employees they're. also obviously do get free license keys. <laughs> Okay, so uh, now that I've managed to assign my license correctly, um, we should, uh, I've, I've fired off that, um, the install VIBS API, so I've, I've just told it which uh, which cluster to install the VIBS on, um, and the first time it said, no thank you, you're not licensed, the second time it's given me another job ID, 
which I could look up using exactly the same URL. So this job data 112, I could use that get job from ID um, and query it again. Um, but let's just go into the installation. Uh, how are we doing? 75% there on a controller. So you can see the controllers deploying here um, and then the host preparation Frank is right he usually is annoyingly um, yeah in parallel it's now installing the VIBs and you can see the um, EAM which is your uh, um, what's it called update manager uh, service is well it's actually not update manager but I'm not going to go into that um, it's installing the VIBs ESX agent manager <laughs> That's the one. I knew, I knew you'd have on the tip of your tongue, whereas I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see if I'm correct. We made it do something. If it actually works, it's, it's a totally different story. <laughs> yeah, it hasn't bombed it out straight away, so that's good. Um, yeah, we shouldn't need the controller until we start actually using the um, uh, preparing for logical network. You're right. Yeah. But th this is actually a fair point on on the job task, right? Um, right right now, what you're seeing is is very little detail in the GUI, um, and rather than digging into logs to see what's my actual progress, um, because zero percent doesn't tell you much, right? Um, this this is actually a very good way to um, to do some initial uh, scoping and troubleshooting on at which stage of a deploy did you actually fail? Yeah. Yep. At which um, so part of the tasks are you stuck on, right? <laughs> yeah, let's let's do that job. Let's go. So we've completed the installed install task. Uh, where are we? So we're not actually getting that much more information. Other than the status is completed. Which it clearly isn't. So I think the status is coming. The job, the job task was to initialize the yeah. installation, and it's handed it off to the AM. Um, so in a, in a second, they'll, they'll all push out all of a sudden, and they'll all be done. Uh, <laughs> it's a race, a race to the end. Uh, so the other tasks. Didn't didn't have any pending reboots on. No, there, look. No, it's, 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 I've done this three times today already. Um, <laughs> I've, got, I've rolled back to a clean snapshot that I know is gonna work. <laughs> but actually, these days, it's, it's pretty reliable anyway, the, the VIB installation, it's not like the old days. Um, and the good thing is in the 6.3 line, you do not need to reboot anymore. You need to put the host into maintenance mode, but... No, these, these aren't in maintenance mode. Uh, uh, for initial installation, not for upgrades. Um, upgrades, yeah. Yeah, you, you need to put them into maintenance mode, um, but you save the 15-minute reboot time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or, 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 or longer if you're running on ropey old lab equipment. Uh, either that or if you're in the fortunate situation of having 1.5 terabytes RAM and more in your server. The, those ECC checks at the beginning uh, don't come for free. <laughs> no. No. I also find when I'm... Uh, yeah, sometimes uh, with my vSAN, because I'm not running with um, technically uh, vSAN compliant uh, HCI, uh, um, HCL listed uh, drivers. Um, sometimes when it reboots, it, it likes to rescan all of my disks to make sure that I'm uh, being punished for not being on the HCL. Um, <laughs> I say that jokingly because I do actually really like vSAN. But... Okay, so we're almost there with the OVF template. A couple more minutes on that one. Annoyingly, it took four minutes the last time I did it. Yeah. Well, you you should be able to still configure the Vita pool, VXLAN segmentation. Yeah. Um, uh, up until sure. 11, we shouldn't need the controller. Yeah, hopefully not. So yeah, IP pool, that's fine. It's exactly the same call as we did for the controllers. We're just creating some some more IPs for the uh, the, the VXLAN tunnel endpoints. So let's send that off, and there we go. 201 created. Got an IP address pool dash two. Um, when we configure VXLAN, um, 
this was the one I went through before. So we're uh, we're creating a cluster mapping spec and a VDS context. Um, so effectively, we are doing in the logical network preparation, we're doing this, or actually clicking on this link from here, and we're selecting the switch, the VLAN that we're using, the MTU that we're going to. We're going to select our new IP pool, and then we're using failover and as you can see it's grayed out there because it, it doesn't want you to make a stupid choice um, so let's do that if it doesn't work it's Frank's fault because he told me to do it early before my controllers are up <laughs> there we go we got another job data and we should this one only takes a few seconds so we should be yeah. configured the nearly configured the uh, I already saw it uh, adding virtual NICs for the VM case, yeah. Yeah, so there we go. We've got three VM kernels been added. Um, you can see like uh, that I'm, I'm using native VLAN, MTU 1600 and failover. Um, that should be, yep, done. Um, so we already did the, we haven't done the segment ID. We can do that. Let's create a segment ID pool. I've got three minutes left to get through the rest of this. Come on, it's not going to happen. That, that, so. That's fine. We, we can do a bit longer. We're also not limited to 60 minutes on the dot. Uh, people might be bored by now. <laughs> be good to see it through. You can edit out all my ums and ahs. And you're up for editing everything, aren't you? There we go. So the segment ID pool is created. And then the transport zone. This is the one we need because we're going to designate a unicast transport zone. We need the we need this controller to be ready. Um, yeah, it should be nearly there. I, I, it I should be. It's it's like yeah, it, it's ah, there doing its go. last last configuration steps. And then it should be done. Any second now. <laughs> there we go. Power on. Auto start. Manager completed. Yeah. So once that once that's up, the API calls back. The private API call goes back to the uh, control. The controller goes back to the manager, registers itself, and we should be happy. Any second now. I mean, if you work in some sort of consultancy role, right? Th those API calls you just showed, uh, put them into some script and then go drink a coffee and charge for the hour it takes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment on automating customers' deployments. Yes. <laughs> How do you think I learned these APIs? Yeah, it's. I, I mean, it's one-time setup, right? It's it's complete repeat, rinse and repeat for for every deploy scenario you can think of. Um, the yeah. the logical network prep, uh, the the host prep, um, in in terms of failover might be different. But if you want consistent lab builds um, and you're you're like me and get bored after seeing this um, for the 50 gazillions time, um, this, this is the very first step to start your automation journey in and, and actually automate the boring stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, I, I presented at um, the UK VMUG last week on exactly that, on automating. So, um, I, I, as I said, I use nested labs. Um, I've automated the pod deployment um, within my lab. Um, so all of this stuff is, is zero touch. I just fire off a script from a JSON file that, that holds all the configuration. Um, and I've also got it doing all of these API calls via PowerNSX. Um, uh, one one more thing, if people want to go down the nested route in their lab as well, um, so yep. you want promiscuous mode on, on the outer port group you connect everything up to, and yep. it needs to be over uh, over the 1500 MTU as well, if, if you want some kind of performance out of the nested NSX, because otherwise you're starting to, to fragment packets and that just gets ugly. So you can see that the port group that I'm on here, um, what Frank's talking about is promiscuous mode and forge trans transmits. Uh, that's set to accept. Um, you can also install. There's a new Mac. Is it Mac Learning switch? Um, uh, so it used to be called. 
oh, I forget what the plugin used to be called. There's a new um, plugin that you can install in your on your um, DVS, which uh, improves the performance of nested environments for sure. Um, yeah, it's on, uh, on the VMware Flink side. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, the MTU of this of all these VLANs is set to uh, jumbo frames now. Oh, come on, you must be done by now. Progress bars are not our strong suit. <laughs> Network virtualization, on the other hand, unbeatable, but progress bars, we still yeah. struggle. Not sure why this is taking so ah oh, there we go connected finally okay so let's rattle through those last few api calls um so creating a transport zone um so we're basically configuring where the transport zone applies to and the mode um if you're doing universal there's a qu there's a query string um, which is question mark uh is universal equals true um, and that would create a universal but you'd need to change the mode for you. so there's other configuration you need but um, yeah you can do that via API um, so let's create a unicast so I've created a new VDN scope um, creating a logical switch um, again very similar API call um, a name of the logical switch description tenant ID if you're using tenancy um, and then the control plane mode um, and up here you can see that on I, in the URL I've put the VDN scope one so the output of the transport zone is the scope of that call so VDN scope one is where is the transport zone where I'm creating the virtual wire um, so I hit the request on that and I get a new virtual wire let's have a look quickly on logical switches and you can see this is my new virtual wire transit network um, creating an edge so creating an edge is a uh, there are a huge number of options you can do for an edge um, my advice with edges is to break it up do the basic deployment first and then post config for things like routing things like uh, load balancing all, all the extra services post that config off on afterwards um, because you can get yourself in very complex config files um, where it makes much uh, it's a much more usable thing if you break it up into different components so what I've got here is a config um, that's just deploying a, a compact one in fact I'll start it off now let's send it because um, it's going to take a few minutes to deploy but we're configuring for example the appliance size um, configuring the uplink to connect to my uh, my port group so the VLAN 205 port group and then transit networks being configured as my internal network um, sticking in a password and a username um, enabling SSH um, doing auto configuration of the rules the firewall rules um, so all of those basic components um, this API works slightly differently in that it waits for the completion of this task before it returns um, so uh, depending on how long that's going to take it's going to do a it's going to return that at a later stage but you'll see it just sit there loading for a long time or for as long as the, the task is going um, and so I'm also going to do um, the logical router control VM um, and it's very similar it, although there are slight tweaks for example there's this management interface section um, and the interfaces rather than the Nix. Uh, so there's slightly different um, configuration to the API. But if you look at the actual post, it's to exactly the same API. So that four zero edges. Um, so let's ping off a DLR control VM. And you can see that I'm connecting that to the, the virtual wire one. So I'm connecting it to that transit network. Um, so when the two of these are completed deployment the two of them can then talk to each other basically um, and we can see the edges config here um, the two of them are installing um, and we can see that the interfaces 
interfaces one's one's being on that vlan the other one connecting to the transit network so i don't want to go over too long because that's just boring for people um but hopefully that gives you a an insight into using the API, um, some actual API calls going on. Um, I don't know if we had any any questions on the webinar that uh, uh, anyone wanted to. So, so far not. If you have any questions, um, there is an actual questions panel. Um, also, one last thing be, before we stop, you just quickly want to show one power NSX uh, call maybe? Because I, uh, I I think it's yeah. a really really cool interface. Um, I so <laughs> small confession here. Um, my laptop at the moment, I I'm struggling to get uh, NSX uh, well PowerShell working on my laptop at the moment. My corporate build does not like it, um, <laughs> so uh, I will have to RDP to machine. Um, just while I'm doing that, uh, so. That's one of my pet projects at the moment. If I get the time, just build a container with um, PowerShell, PowerCLI, and PowerNSX in it that I could, can just spin up. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah, so I do have Docker running on this machine. Um, let's see what I left running on here. Okay. Uh, Okay, so um, I've just literally pumped out all of the commands that are available from the uh, NS Power NSX module. Um, so let's uh, just get a logical switch or something. You, we know you created the. So, yeah. So what we can do connect NSX server. Um, server was 921682051. Uh, username was let's use it. This is all a nested lab, so I'm not too worried about giving off my password. Oh, it's your super secret the password that <laughs> nobody else, nobody ever uses that out. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, it's. <laughs> Uh, what am I doing wrong? Uh, escape your password. It's it's PowerShell. It probably doesn't like the uh, no in uh, in d double quotes. Yeah. It probably doesn't like the exclamation mark. Uh, let me. Uh, view. So I'll I'll show a quick example of my pod deployment script, which is again on um, uh, GitHub. Um, so using NSX, Power NSX here. What are we doing? Ba -ba -ba. So I connect to connect to the NSX server. That's the command I was just doing. Um, get the vCenter config, um, set NSX manager, vCenter username, and vCenter password. So the API call that I did that configured the uh, the um, vCenter connection. Um, you can also do the same, the SSO manager config, um, and again, set the SSO username and SSO user password. So the API call going from these functions in the background is the exact same API call that I used from Postman to do those tasks. Um, it just, uh, is gives you a nice uh, command line way of doing it, creating IP pools. You'll notice the series of tasks that I'm doing in this script are very similar to the series of tasks that I've just done. Um, deploying controllers, um, preparing the hosts, so installing an SX cluster. Um, all of these commands are part of the Power NSX module. So NSX pool, creating a VTEP. Pull, uh, an IP pool for the VTEPs. Again, literally everything that we've just done, um, the VDS, VDS context. Um, so using the load balance by source ID, uh, setting the MTU, um, all, all of those things, configuring VXLAN, um, the VLAN ID that I'm setting, 
number of VTEPs. So I'm using a different load balancing method there. So I'm using two VTEPs. Um, creating a transport zone, all those sorts of things. Um, I don't think I'm going to troubleshoot that connection to the, I think it's probably to do with my certificates and the level of acceptance I've got on my certificates there. Um, but you can see it's it's hugely powerful. So um, all of those API calls to configure NSX are in this block here. That's that's just does all, all of that configuration for me. Um, so Power, Power NSX is, is a fantastic tool. Um, yeah, I don't think you want to see me troubleshoot that in, on live on screen. No, um, well, that's fine. <laughs> we just needed <laughs> to so bridge time until your routers are deployed, which just happened. <laughs> yeah. So um, the resources I was talking about, the um, URL is here, the GitHub. Uh, so it's on uh, the Brown Bag NSX API. Um, I've got a Postman collection, uh, which is the requests that I've used in this demo and also the environment that, so if you want to download it um, you can download it install um, import them uh, edit the environment and put in the values for your environment and um, yeah you can use that yourself um, and just get familiar with the API calls have a little kick the tires um, uh, and also that NSX uh, API mind map um, is up there as well and PDF version um, and where, I don't know, were there any questions? I don't know which. Um... Nope, no questions so far. No, no questions. Um, if, if you do not have the license, the kit, etc., to play around with this, but want to familiarize yourself with it, basically every VMware hands on lab template that includes NSX also should include Postman. So um, there, there's nothing preventing you from not destroying your production environment <laughs> while experimenting around. Um, and for me, my lab environment is production because I need it for customer use cases. So if that, that's the approach I usually take, if I just want to dip my feet into new waters, um, I usually just take the VMware hands-on labs and destroy everything in them because there I can simply redeploy on not even my hardware, but VMware paid hardware, which is a yeah, that's how everybody, right? Yeah, yeah, that's how I first learned. Um, so I went, I, I was lucky enough to get on a, uh, an enablement course for PSO consultants. Um, but then once I got back from that, I didn't have any of the binaries or anything. So I, I literally jumped on hands on labs and just broke it and fixed it and broke it and broke it. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Thank you very, very much, Sam, for presenting. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yep. And with that, oh, one second. No, yeah. Audience also says great presentation. Um, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Okay, cool. Then. I'll stop the recording and uh, this should be up on YouTube in a couple of days um, and I'll make sure to include that link that you had um, so that you guys can download the examples and um, play with this in your own time. Thank you very much and see you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks very much.